Welcome to the United Lodge of Theosophists here in Santa Barbara. You just saw the um, wooden box be brought up here. And that in that wooden box, people have been uh, volunteering written questions. And tonight will be a special meeting devoted to answering those questions. She's already opening up to see what they are. Um, and also, we'll, before that, we'll hear a short talk um, entitled Theosophical Study and Work. And no doubt that is in relation to this time of year being later Labor Day, we're thinking about work. So what about theosophical study and work? Next week, um, Sunday night on September 7, we will be hearing about another very thought-provoking question, subject, God and Satan. All of the uh, meeting titles are meant to provoke the mind and to awaken the thinking principle. And if enough questions are asked, certainly awaken the principle of intuition. There's a revolution inherently built into theosophy. What if you just walked up to the average person on the street and you said, you know, there's a, system, there's a wisdom religion. It's a fundamental system that underlies all these different religions. And if you watch CNN or something and you get frightened by all the violence that has to do with religion, think about it. There's a system underneath all that from which all these religions came. And Also, probably with enough eons of time, more and more, perhaps the majority of mankind will learn about and participate in this wisdom religion because it's the fundamental inheritance of all peoples. So there's a revolution built into theosophy. Also, this is the United Lodge of Theosophists and it has a very special uh, declaration, and it's very deep. And um, there was a group of theosophists, 150 or so, that met in Europe this summer, and they crafted, you know, from different groups, theosophical groups, different societies, organizations, and so forth, and they crafted what a declaration of what it might be like if different theosophists were able to study together. And what they came up with was, to me, something that sounds very much like the ULT declaration, which was crafted 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago. So it's an incredibly forward-looking document that one could think about. There's another revolution in the ULT declaration. The Lodge is on summer recess as far as its uh, Wednesday night meeting, and my understanding is that it will start in the first Wednesday in October. You got it right? And a reading has been selected to proceed tonight's theme on Theosophical Study and Work. And this is the most hit the mark selection for a reading than I think anybody could have done for this subject. It's from the Voice of the Silence. And it has a few Tibetan mystical terms in it. It refers to um, Tibetan astrology, two of the planets, Mars and Mercury, Big Mar and Lagpa, and also refers to the sun as Niima. It says, follow the wheel of life. Follow the wheel of duty <coughs> to race and kin, to friend and foe, and close thy mind to pleasures as to pain. Exhaust 
the law of karmic retribution. Gain siddhis for thy future birth. If sun thou canst not be, then be the humble planet. I, if thou art debarred from flaming like the noonday sun upon the snow-capped mount of purity eternal, then choose, O neophyte, a humbler course. Point out the way, however dimly, and lost among the host, as does the evening star to those who tread their path in darkness. Behold Mi'kmaq, as in his crimson veils his eye sweeps over slumbering earth. Behold the fiery aura of the hand of Lagpa, extended in protecting love over the heads of his ascetics. Both are now servants to Naima. Left in his absence, silent watchers in the night. Yet both in Kalpa's past were bright Naimas, and may in future days again become two sons. Such are the falls and rises of the karmic law in nature. Be, O Lanu, like them. Give light and comfort to the toiling pilgrim, and seek out him who knows still less than thou, who in his wretched desolation sits starving for the bread of wisdom and the bread which feeds the shadow, without a teacher, hope, or consolation, and let him hear the law. Tell him, O candidate, that he who makes of pride and self-regard bond maidens to devotion, that he who, cleaving to existence, still lays his patience and submission to the law, as a sweet flower at the feet of Sakya Thugpa, becomes a strotapati in this birth. The cities of perfection may loom far, far away, but the first step is taken, the stream is entered, and he may gain the eyesight of the mountain eagle, the hearing of the timid doe. Tell him, O aspirant, that true devotion may bring him back the knowledge, that knowledge which was his in former births. The Deva's sight and the Deva hearing are not obtained in one short birth. Be humble, if thou wouldst attain to wisdom. Be humbler still, when wisdom thou hast mastered. Be like the ocean, which receives all streams and rivers. The ocean's mighty calm remains unmoved, it feels them not. friends. Whether we know it or not, under karma we have encountered a great treasure. It is a treasure that cannot be measured by any earthly terms, whether by coin or by personal prestige, but offers the priceless gift of true nourishment to the soul. In the writings of H.P. Blavatsky, as given in The Secret Doctrine, Isis Unveiled, The Key to Theosophy, and her translation of The Voice of the Silence. We have what we see as an authentic expression of the Sanatana Dharma, the uh, timeless, ageless, uh, undying stream of ancient universal wisdom, of wisdom heaven born. And this conviction comes to the student, whether through long hours of study and careful thought uh, and application, 
or through the contributions of brilliant teachers and co-students, or through golden moments of intuition and insight. It is a teaching that can be found, as mentioned, at the root of all the great world's religions, and it is consonant with other expressions of the perennial philosophy, such as found in great spiritual works, such as the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads, as well as in revered, the words of revered teachers, such as Shantideva, Plato, and Emerson, and many others. But it also offers something unique that uh, cannot be found stated with such clarity and precision anywhere else in, that we know of in the historical record. And once this conviction has ar arisen in the mind, other questions arise. How do we show our gratitude? What is the proper use of such a teaching? And repeatedly we're told that this grand philosophy was handed down, not so that we ourselves may progress, but so that we may hand it on to others. That we may have ready at hand the right body of literature, the right ideas, the right words at the right moment, in order to assist our neighbor on the right path. And uh, in an article by W.Q. Judge called Closed or Open Lodges, he states, it can never be too often repeated that real theosophy is not contemplation or introspection or philosophizing or talk, but work, work for others, work for the world. We are told that the one fatal bar to progress is selfishness in some one of its protean forms. It will never be overcome by thinking about oneself, but by not thinking about oneself. And as we have to think about something, the alternative is thought for others and how to help them. As the mind fills with such schemes and the hands take hold of them, self-interest is displaced, is displaced rather, and egoism fades out. Selfishness dies, the inanition, that's lack of nourishment. And altruism grows because constantly fed, the mind clears of prejudices and fogs, the spirit grows more sunny and cheerful, peacefulness settles over the whole interior being, and truth is seen with greater distinctness, for the great hindrance to evolution is decaying away. To work for theosophy, then, is not only to work for those immediately around oneself and the community with which one engages, but also to insert oneself into a larger plan, as we've been taught. And this is a plan conceived by masters, who uh, those enlightened beings who have guided human evolution since its inception, who send their agents or messengers into the world in the last quarter of each century to instruct and aid. And H.P. Blavatsky was one such messenger who in the 18th century brought to the West this magnificent teaching uh, designed to baffle all forms of mental imprisonment that plague mankind. Those of materialism, uh, dogmatic sectarianism, uh, spiritualism, the, uh, all forms of prejudice, intolerance, and superstition. In fact, everything that artificially divides people one from the other. And <clears throat> it is a work that is just as pertinent to the present moment as it is to centuries and millennia to come, we're told, uh, especially as uh, hidden capacities and psychic powers begin to awaken within the race. Uh, because if these, if such de developments occur without the guidance of right philosophy and the principles of unity and brotherhood, uh, they will only lead to greater suffering for human beings, to uh, tremendous mental and physical um, dangers and destruction. So in his article on uh, Theosophical Work and Study, 
judge states that the duty of each student is made plain, that we should, quote, do the utmost in our power to understand and preserve this teaching in its original purity, literature, and original plan, so that we may pass it on to others who may do the same. And it is for, uh, it is for this purpose that, in fact, ULT was founded, uh, that this lodge was dedicated, this platform, this branch, uh, not as a proselytizing scheme, but as Judge says, as a center of light and hope for others, as a means of propagating and circulating the highest truths. Um, and it is through such a branch, he says, that a far more potent and widespread influence can be affected than can be had by uh, any individual effort. And in uh, <clears throat> The article um, that we just read out from, uh, Judge also explains that um, just as each person within a branch can be thought of as a cell, as a, a, of a living, a living organism, living, breathing organism, and that the health of the branch can be determined by the unselfish efforts of each of its members so too can a branch be thought of as a cell within the great, the larger theosophic body. Um, and uh, just as uh, no person uh, should think that they are too insignificant or too um, unprogressed to think that their efforts have, cannot be a benefit to the movement, so too should no branch think that its life and vitality is somehow uh, inconsequential to the whole. That, uh, he says, uh, by virtue of the law of unity and reciprocating influences on the unseen plane, that, quote, we are all keepers of each other, uh, whether, whether we're, again, whether we're aware of it or not. We aid those, whether other lodges in the United States, Asia, Europe, South America, and elsewhere. Those that have light uh, will attract more light and will automatically assist others who are seeking it, whereas those who have allowed darkness to creep in will attract more darkness. Again, uh, from the same article. So long as it, a branch, exists only for the improvement or entertainment of its members, the selfish principle is dominant. For selfishness is not the less genuine because applied to purposes in themselves high. Such a branch does not expect to grow. It probably does not desire to grow, and it surely will not grow. What is there to make it grow? It lacks that essence of all life and growth which pervades everything vital. Preparation of papers or discussion does not mean that mere exhibition of personal ideas, still less speculation on curious and recondite problems, but the arrangement in lucid language of those apprehensions of truth which the thinker believes to have intellectual or practical value. It is a gift to others, not a display of self. The life principle of all nature then flows through the being, clarifying thought, vivifying motive, energizing speech. Then it flows without, warming dull or listless ears, arousing attention, exciting interest, stimulating inquiry. So the influence spreads, attendance increases, the branch grows. By selfishness, Judge says, that each of us builds up a, an actual wall in the material of the mind that prevents us from accessing those truths that we would wish to understand. But the opposite is also true, that by each person eliminating that desire in themselves to gain knowledge for some personal uh, benefit, uh, that we that, that, the, that the branch 
as a whole becomes more porous and open to uh, what Judge calls those unseen influences managed by uh, masters and their true disciples, who he says are constantly at work fanning the flame of spiritual influence amongst us. Judge says that we also err if we think that our community or our culture is not yet ready for theosophy. Um, that instead we should hold in mind the idea with joy that theosophy is the answer that, uh, that many can benefit from in, in the same manner that we have benefit, benefited, that we then throw open the inner doors, the welcoming doors, to those who are searching. And of course he says that uh, branch growth is not possible without in, uh, meetings being made interesting, without uh, uh, talks that are uh, uh, duly and properly prepared, uh, without uh, essays that are well researched and well composed. He also says that thoughtful contributions to open discussions are as much an aid to expansion and growth as periodicals and libraries. Uh, but he says that such di discussions should be conducted in such a way that no one person is allowed to assert that their view is the only correct one, that truth cannot be got at by, by assertion, uh, that the, the self-asserter actually debars themselves from the truth, no mind is capable of grasping all the knowledge given, uh, and that truth is best arrived at through a um, calm consideration of all the views advanced and what he calls a concurrence of investigation. Uh, that H.P. Um, uh, Blavatsky states emphatically that orthodoxy in theosophy is neither possible nor desirable. Uh, that diversity of opinion and of expression should be welcomed because it keeps the, the, the body something living uh, and active. Um, often it is helpful, it seems, for the student to always refer back to the teachings, the source of the teaching, so that others can investigate for themselves as well. Our primary aim, says Judge, should be to explain and illustrate the doctrine of universal brotherhood and the actual fact of the living unity of all beings. And this, he says, uh, this effort will explain many other doctrines because it underlies them all, small and great, and that this can best be done by uh, the student attempting to get a a grasp of the system as a whole so that its component parts can be understood. That the, um, the effort should be to uh, understand the broad outlines and make them part of our mental furniture, so to speak. And these two articles that we've been referring to by Judge were written before the ocean of theosophy was written, but we think that many students would affirm that that, uh, that work is an excellent way to get a broad understanding of the, uh, the principles and the, and the philosophy of theosophy that is completely consonant with the secret doctrine and, and very systematically presented as well. Um, next, Judge says that we need to learn how to apply fundamental propositions to each and every question. Uh, and, and in this way, we'll learn how to present the doctrines, the teachings that he says, and stated elsewhere as well, will solve every problem in life. That the common man, as well as the developing child we know, is yearning to know uh, why we are here, why men and women must suffer, and where justice may be found. And that these uh, cannot be answered properly either by contemporary science or by the uh, religious systems of the day, but uh, only the, the great twin doctrines of karma and re reincarnation can provide the answer. 
And he says these, these, uh, uh, these twin uh, doctrines have a mysterious power because the ego, the, the immortal ego, which has actual uh, experience and is constantly in contact with these realities, rejoices when the lower mind takes them up for study. And therefore, our aim should be uh, to uh, uh, both in search and promulgation uh, to explain and illustrate the, the ethics of theosophy as um, uh, enforced by these uh, two great teachings. And at first, through study, words, and literature, and then through practical exemplification in our own lives and realization of them. And I will close with uh, these words from H.P. Blavatsky uh, from the Five Articles. After all, every wish and thought I can utter are summed up in this one sentence, the never dormant wish of my heart. Be theosophists, work for theosophy. Theosophy first and theosophy last. For its practical realization alone can save the Western world from that selfish and unbrotherly feeling that now divides race from race, one nation from the other, and from that hatred of class and from social stripes that are the curse and disgrace of so-called Christian peoples. Theosophy alone can save it from sinking entirely into that mere luxurious materialism in which it will decay and putrefy as older civilizations have done. In your hands, brothers, is placed in trust the welfare of the coming century. And great as is the trust, so great is also the responsibility. questions that have been put in the box and we want to emphasize that um, questions on any theosophical uh, uh, teaching is welcome and so um, if after a talk you have an unanswered question you're free to uh, put it in the box and after we've um, responded to these questions we'll take questions from the floor. Um, we'll start with this rather simple statement of a question. <laughs> um, what should humanity learn in the Kali Yuga? Now, of course it's impossible to state <laughs> um, either exactly or completely um, everything um, we might learn in a particular age. Uh, Kali Yuga is one of the four uh, cycles um, given a great deal of explanation in Mr. Judge's um, Ocean of Theosophy as well as in the Secret Doctrine. Um, it's sometimes referred to as the Iron Age or the Dark Age. Um, it's shorter than the other um, ages of gold, silver, and bronze. It's only something like uh, 432,000 years. And we're said to be uh, about 5,000 years through um, the current cycle of Kali Yuga. Um, in one way, of course, uh, we should learn the same thing that we're trying to learn in any other age. Um, we're trying to learn uh, who we are um, and what we're to develop our mind, to develop our knowledge, to develop our um, intuition, our ethical discernment, our compassion, uh, to fully realize our um, self-conscious immortality um, and to um, learn uh, 
more about the great cycles of evolution and how we can contribute and be on track to um, um, a wise participation in that vast, vast uh, process of um, evolution that leads, among other things, to spiritual self-realization and paves the way for other monads in um, uh, less developed stages to move into um, a cycle of self-realization. Um, and that means we also must learn about karma and um, uh, have a more di direct um, experience and confidence in reincarnation. And as pointed out in the talk, we would learn more about the unity of all life and the importance of um, human brotherhood uh, developed in a ethical and um, nurturing way. But if we were to focus, well, what particular, as the questioner has done, might we learn about Kali Yuga? Um, that's an interesting question to think about. But it, if it's true that Kali Yuga is an age that, on the one hand, um, material, um, the material that we have to work with is denser, um, that it is more difficult for spiritual light to actually penetrate um, all the um, vast uh, aspects of manifestation. If therefore, um, as souls, we find it more difficult to understand and experience um, our true spiritual identity, to think at uh, more pure and rarefied uh, levels of uh, consciousness, um, it means it's going to be harder uh, to discover what our true purpose is. It's going to be harder to um, rise above the tremendous density of um, particularly of the, the gunas and that we will um, in, in a sense have a, a bigger challenge which is very apparent in today's world when it seems that um, um, it's hard for people to understand their, um, their better nature and they're more caught up in material, um, material desires and more caught up in um, a kind of a grasping um, governed by uh, the desire mind and to even keep basic control of themselves and to uh, focus on and understand uh, worthy ethical purposes. And so we look around the world um, and we see um, almost like a a vast um, chase for things, um, for um, self, self regarding, selfish um, uh, acquisition of powers or goods or things like that. Um, and it's not a pretty world. And brotherhood seems to be um, shunted aside as a, um, as a foolish ideal. Um, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world and all of that. And so the more that human souls are um, bound into this uh, materialistic, uh, and we don't just mean going to the mall, the materialistic um, um, density um, that pervades our consciousness, um, the more miserable we're going to be and the more we're actually going to um, uh, see cycles and acts of violence, of corruption, and all of that. Now, the good news, we're told, is that um, the, uh, during the period of Kali Yuga, there, it's, um, it's, everything is heated up, as we don't need to be told that very much. It seems pretty obvious. Everything is heated up. Um, we can drive, you know, it's 80 miles an hour at the freeway pretty easily, and we can um, work, you know, 15 hours a day, and we can buy and discard and buy some more. 
everything is, is, is heated up, the cycle moves faster. Um, it's almost like um, we're constantly just at the level of the weather received by tornadoes or hurricanes or earthquakes. And um, it's a, there's an instability, but that provides an opportunity. Um, if um, manifestation is moving more quickly, that means if we can kind of grab on um, to something uh, firm in our minds, and particularly if we um, make an effort to minimize conflict and maximize cooperation, we actually can make commitments, um, establish goals, and move towards them um, more quickly than in a lovely golden age. So um, that means that we can engage in not just self-transformation, uh, but we can um, uh, participate in social change, difficult as it is, but um, find that there can be results uh, more quickly. Uh, there also can, uh, these results can be destructive, um, but they, uh, which is what we're seeing with uh, the rapid uh, dissemination of weapons around the world and almost anybody can get some pretty uh, destructive weapons and do great damage. But on the other hand, um, if we look at all the change that's come into just the last hundred years um, and just look at something, you know, much praise goes to the internet and question mark, you know, whether um, how, how much good comes out of the, the internet or other forms of communication. Uh, we're certainly all bearing witness to more, but we're also able to learn more. Uh, so Kali Yuga can be a time of rapid precipitation, but it also can be a time of um, uh, more rapid um, accomplishment. Um, if we have the strength of mind and the trueness of a heart uh, dedicated to good purposes, um, much more can be accomplished. If we just look at um, uh, the life of HBB, um, it's just amazing uh, how much she accomplished. And even though she took um, at least three decades to prepare herself for her role, um, traveled around the world, uh, but um, um, gathered um, through various means information about the heritage of the world's um, religions and philosophies and sciences, uh, made it available, and a hundred years later you have um, uh, still a gathering that is de mentioned in the announcements dedicated to the, um, the continued focus on a promulgation of the teachings of HBB. Um, and you can look at many different um, currents of thought um, that came out of her teaching that doesn't seem like it's associated with theosophy, but it is, um, um, it really does express core theosophical ideas. Indeed, a research uh, survey recently said that 60% of Americans um, put together various elements to call their religion rather than just adhere to one. And that's the kind of part of the, the, uh, the synthesis of many currents that we think is um, possible in Kali Yuga. Uh, this question, in the Declaration of ULT, it states, that work and that end is the dissemination of the fundamental principles of the philosophy of theosophy and the exemplification in practice of those principles through a truer realization of the self, a profounder conviction of universal brotherhood. Why is a truer realization of the self important? Well, we think that in both um, work, study and work, and really anything we attempt to do, um, 
it's, it is important to uh, know who you are um, in order to um, move on constructively and to um, work with karma effectively. Uh, for some reason, perhaps because we watched a football game yesterday, um, if a quarterback didn't have a sense of himself and what he was capable of, he couldn't really function as a very effective quarterback. Um, and we're all quarterbacks insofar as we need to manage our lives. And to do that, we, we need knowledge. Uh, but not if, if we have, if we're bound up in a very false, delusionary sense of who we are, we're not going to acquire knowledge correctly. Um, our, the knowledge is going to ref, uh, reflect the falseness of the self that um, uh, you might say uh, perceives it and puts it together. So false self leads to false knowledge. Um, the, and we have a, a very immediate um, proof of this. Uh, we all know if we're, you know, very focused on some particular uh, desire, we just have to have that um, $60,000 car or something, or we just have to have a, um, a $50 dinner, um, we're, if, you know, we're really focused and that's the only thing that's going to uh, really show who we are. Um, we're going to suffer consequences, or we're going to be in debt, or we're going to whatever. Um, we're not. Um, if we pursue things with uh, with a through come among us, the desire mind, um, we're going to uh, reap the the karma. That's probably not going to be very helpful, whether it's expensive or makes us sick or makes us, um, gets us in trouble with other people. So um, there's just a practical side to this. But most importantly, and we're talking about something, trying to understand um, the highest level kind of knowledge, spiritual knowledge, um, metaphysical knowledge, of course we need a pure, um, instrument that's capable of insight into what is truly true, so to speak. Um, so we, what really has to happen is that we develop um, a self that can think, um, that can uh, question, that can learn by uh, listening to others, um, and by practice, and so we develop um, a self that's capable of insight, uh, understanding of what of the highest level of truth that we are capable of at that time. And the true a true self also a true sense of self is also uh, capable of better critical thinking, is ba uh, capable of questioning what it has learned and might be bear some relative truth, but that can begin to go beyond some proposition, some value that we have come into realization of, and um, move into a, um, a deeper, broader understanding of what exists and how, um, how we can practice the principles of theosophy. So as we grow in um, we develop a self that's capable of more, we're going to be able to gain um, a better understanding of the principles of theosophy. And uh, lastly, we might um, say that it is our better self, um, a self that is um, more uh, relies upon the higher capacities and even the soul capacities within us that it is probably is going to be better able to understand and practice brotherhood. Um, we we probably all experienced um, some kind of situation in which we really do feel a dedication to help 
or we're, you know, we're forgetting all the prejudice and likes and dislikes and aches and pains, and we're really focused um, quite um, purely and ethically on helping another or um, perhaps helping in some project that is constructive. Um, and so if we're, the more we're in that state, the more we're likely to um, be in harmony with um, the situation we're in and be constructive um, in that situation. So uh, um, without true self-realization, um, we're really only half a person and uh, constantly going to be trapped in the various um, um, semblances and shadows um, that distort um, our progress. In the talk last week, love of all humanity was equated with practical altruism. It was suggested that we can see the self as an impersonal unit within the whole. Can more be said about what it might mean to see oneself as an impersonal unit within the whole? But we think and we've uh, addressed that question in uh, response to the last question, um, but we would just want to stress that um, um, impersonal unit doesn't perhaps, um, we don't find that, perhaps we don't find that is the best way we want to describe ourselves, but it's conveying an important idea um, that it is impersonality, and Mr. Judge and Mr. Crosby emphasize this a great deal. Um, it is impersonality um, that empowers us to see more truly and therefore to um, have some creative and we might say karmically ac accurate understanding of what needs to be done in a situation. Um, we, an example would be of course in medicine. When the doctor or the nurse comes in and we're suffering from some kind of pain or maybe even some kind of uh, trauma, is, uh, traumatic reaction is set in, um, we want them to give a completely impersonal analysis of what's wrong. Um, we don't want them to be thinking about, well, my grandmother once told me this, or whatever. Um, it's impersonality, which um, we would assume is um, uh, the basis of an objective and most relevant um, uh, solution. Uh, to um, whatever problem we're um, experiencing. So there are many, um, we expect judges to be impersonal, we expect teachers uh, to be uh, impersonal. That doesn't mean cold and um, a kind of uh, impervious to uh, people's feelings or their sensitivities. Um, a great deal of effort is made in today's world, fortunately, finally. Um, to be more culturally sensitive and going sticking with the um, medical um, example. Uh, so we, you know, doctors and uh, nurses and healthcare providers are trained with, to, to have more cultural sensitivity. Um, and that, 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 that's part of it. Um, so we have to be careful. By impersonal, we mean that you're not caught in your kind of self-regarding perspective. Well, I'm going to do this surgery in a way that you know, shows everybody what a fantastic um, doc, surgeon I am and um, you know, be a star among um, the doctors in this hospital or something. That's probably an attitude uh, that could lead uh, to mistakes. And the same can be true with just in personal relationships. If we're um, you know, just too caught up in ourselves, we might say something or not say something that would be helpful in the situation, um, and or say something that's not helpful. So we need to, um, perhaps it's a, um, a simple thing that we're all taught that in a, uh, maybe in a group discussion, uh, don't try to dominate or prevail. 
really cultivate, and that's very important in terms of theosophical study. Um, we're constantly taught that the value of dialogue, of listening to others, of seeing their perspective, because we're at a level where all our propositions are really in the category of relative knowledge. So um, we need to be open and flexible to other points of view, which um, might add to, or even just plain correct, um, uh, the limitations in our own point of view. So there's just, um, it's hard to, um, it's hard to imagine um, effectiveness in practical altruism without a, um, a strong commitment and development of impersonality. And what, of course, is one of the many mysteries of theosophical teaching is that impersonality can lead, lead to greater love of, of our brothers and sisters and all that lives. Um, we tend to think that uh, love of humanity requires a lot of emotion and um, um, a demonstration of our of our feelings and um, and that's what that's what altruism or service is, is based on and um, that may not be sometimes uh, well uh, we can uh, kind of get into um, a state that's anything but practical uh, so that we again in personality may mean that we can function on a level of thought and feeling that is um, far tr more true an expression of love of humanity. And there's probably um, no better way to demonstrate uh, the love of humanity uh, than with um, altruism that really is practical, it's relevant, it's sensitive to the situation and therefore um, uh, actually can bring some change into the operation of karma in that situation. But perhaps others have suggestions or they would like to ask other questions. Yes. <clears throat> the speaker was mentioning that uh, would it be wise to, uh, to uh, observe principles of reincarnation and karma in our lives and to learn from that. Could you say something about uh, going beyond the subjective, uh, most probably erroneous observation of reincarnation and karma, and how can you look at it more objectively? Because it is such a kind of, it seems almost inherently subjective. You're looking at your life and yourself in your situation and trying to understand reincarnation, um, uh, how can that be done with the higher mind rather than with the lower? How can we try to understand karma and reincarnation with the higher mind rather than with the lesser um, mindfulness? Uh, we're, we're taught that uh, yes, of course, to understand who we are and what, how karma is at work in our life, there has to be self-study. Um, what did I say that brought that on? Uh, what did I do that brought that on? Now, for most of us, it starts in a very limited way, you know, because we can only remember what happened in the last two or three days. Um, we may not remember what happened 20 years ago, and we may not even have a glimpse of what might have happened, you know, 50 lives ago. So we have to start small, um, and we have to be earnest and clear, and um, um, try to avoid rationalizations, because the lower mind, as soon as it, uh, we probably experience this, the lower mind is still, as soon as it notices something, like, yeah, I probably shouldn't have said that, it immediately wants to find the justification for why it was okay to say that. In other words, uh, the lower mind's very clever in covering up what might have been some, some errors. Um, and it's also c capable of distorting 
what we said or did that might have been uh, fairly good because um, it always wants to put a gloss that's self-serving on it. So we need to learn um, truthfulness in our self-study. And that, um, there's no one else that can do that for us. Um, and it takes time and we learn as we go through the days and years of life. But we're also told that's too, ultimately that's too limited. We have to understand human nature in a broader and deeper way, which means we have to understand other people. And that um, may meet and say, well, I have to understand significant others or coworkers or whatever. But not to do this in a prying way, and certainly not to do it in a judgmental way, but to become a good scientist of, um, of human nature. And that can keep us busy for a very long time, because that's, a, that's, quite a, that's quite a challenge. But it does broaden and deepen our understanding of how karma works. And it's OK even to um, give some thought to the president or the pope or whatever and try to understand what they're up to um, and what they're doing and how they're reacting. So we can look to very um, um, uh, people who have significant roles, but we can also learn from the, um, the whoever it is at some 7-Eleven you know, that we shop at. So there's, it's a kind of a mixture um, of effort, and we can also ask questions of other people. Um, well, how do you, what do you think that happens um, when such and such happens? So the study of karma is broad and, um, you might say, ever ongoing, and, it's, um, and we do meet people who seem to have a, um, a grasp of a situation of why something happened very quickly. And while we are kind of stuck and not able, but we can learn, we can learn. Um, the study of reincarnation is, um, is obviously more challenging because the, the lower mind and the personality is a creation of this life and it doesn't remember um, its um, previous lives, perhaps fortunately although it can recognize tendencies that it doesn't have a clear explanation of, but kind of think, well, this is a strong tendency. It's probably been around quite a while. Um, but we also, there is possible to have glimpses of uh, previous lives. It is possible to rise to a level of, you might say, soul perception, so that we're closer to the memory bank of previous lives. And, but that takes, um, um, we think that takes practice in a deliberate raising of our consciousness, uh, perhaps in, um, through meditation and daily study. Um, we do become, um, well, now let's put it this way, the eternal witness, the, the, the best, um, source of information, you might say, for most of us, of uh, what, um, who we really are, and what our uh, most true perspectives based upon experience of previous lives is, um, is the eternal witness. Um, and that's spoken of, that um, while we're busy running around doing this and doing that, um, there always is the eternal wit witness, the truth, um, which represents, let's put it that way, represents um, the um, existence and the knowledge of the soul. And so it, um, it's there, and it can't stop us from doing stupid things, but it's ever there watching, and we can, we can feel that. Uh, there are times when, when, when we really, that eternal witness is really close to our consciousness. And then that can be very instructive. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you, you know, there are stories and experiences 
um, someone's about to do something or you're about to do something and you just get this really strong thought, no, don't do it. Um, so um, I, we think that developing a, um, uh, it's not just a question of techniques of meditation or um, methods of self-study, um, but some, what seems lacking is a faith that we are the immortal soul, that there is an eternal witness. And developing that faith um, is important to getting, to, to bringing that, um, that true self into um, influence, let's say, over ordinary levels of consciousness and expanding our understanding of why something is happening what we, what's the source of the problem, or what's the source of the um, imaginative creativity that we suddenly demonstrate um, in a situation. So we do think that um, it is a challenge. Uh, it is the, in one way, it's the most important challenge of our lives to understand the karma that it, we're bound up in. And um, in one way, unfortunately, um, we may not get some real clear lessons till close to the moment of death. Um, and part of the um, purpose of the theosophical teaching is to get us to do more thinking and review um, and get the benefit of new decisions about practice all through our life rather than waiting for some deathbed review uh, because it's only during life that we can make uh, constructive changes. Yeah. Uh, in regard to the last question and response, it seems like the uh, assumption of reincarnation is critical to doing practical work in the furtherance of human brotherhood because we also have to consciously assert that other people have their eternal witnesses also a behind and, and uh, within what we're perceiving and what we're witnessing through their actions we can't see this uh, true self and if we assert that uh, there's a whole different dynamic that can arise between our in, in, within our interaction with those people that we're trying to help or be of assistance to. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems, going back to the talk, uh, this can institute a kind of uh, uh, inner relationship that is, is much deeper than the personal level at which people often interact. Um, there's a, a, a vibrational uh, resonance that can begin to develop as we're working with people and uh, trying to help whatever our mission is in that particular time. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it seems like besides asserting it about ourselves, asserting it about all that we come into contact, all people we come into contact with is critical. And also with animals and lower forms of life, if we also assert that these are going through a cycle of progress from, from lower to higher forms, um, we might not think they would be capable of self-consciousness in the way that humans are, but if we can remember that some at some cycle in the future they will be, uh, our relationship with all of life then becomes enriched and enhanced and deepened. Um, presumably everyone heard that extensive comment which is really very helpful. Um, this uh, starting almost with a with the with a commitment to the idea that other people <laughs> are living souls with their experience and that um, that therefore, nothing else, it should start with respect. 
um, that everyone has, and you can, you can almost feel this better with very young people and very old people, but uh, uh, that every, uh, every entity, including the monads that are still in animal forms um, and other um, lower kingdoms, um, that they are to be recognized as um, on the journey too, and that the, and that they'll have um, that they're not just having opinions. One of the ways in which pop culture uh, really um, can interfere with true perception is, oh well, what you say is just an opinion, and my opinion is. And so long as we're stuck with that perception of what other people say um, and do, it's really um, undermines um, both a, a truer understanding of others, but um, to see their, their, their viewpoints and their decisions as a, helpful to the situation and helpful to you. Um, we kind of live in a culture where self-reliance and individuality is so strong um, that we blind ourselves to the idea that uh, just um, just being in the presence of um, a soul masked in a certain body and all um, may be a source of strength or um, guidance, just the way somebody else does something, uh, let alone says something. So that does seem my very, very important comment, and which is why, um, again, experience of community, experience of di dialogue, experience of cooperation, and even experience of uh, conflict um, is is part construct can be a constructive part of our journey. Uh, the Buddha and the Dalai Lama um, both say, you know, learn from your enemy. Well, because your enemy is perceived as an enemy, but maybe if there's something there for you that you need to learn about, and both learn for the sake of understanding others, but also learn for the sake of understanding yourself. Um, other comments or questions? This may be a rather broad question, but we are not seeking a lot broad answer, but Theosophy is defined as synthesis of science, religion, and philosophy. And in applying theosophical principles, how should we apply theosophical principles in the light or in the world in, of uh, dogmatic religion, dogmatic science, dogmatic uh, philosophy, more or less? We are not saying, but just broadly, what this is this is what we confront. Well, first of all, we'll refer you to the three art articles in Vidya magazine. <laughs> Um, theosophy as religion, um, that's well, theosophy as philosophy, and the issue that will be on the table next week, theosophy as science, because that's a more thorough exploration of exactly what is being asked. Um, how do you, how does, um, what kind of religious, or how does theosophy, um, you might say, express religious ideas? How does it express, how does it use philosophy? How does it, um, how is it becoming apparent in, in science and consistent with scientific method? So we really would refer you to those, to those articles. Um, but broadly speaking, um, again, for the core, to, as has been expressed in different ways, we hope, uh, this evening, um, a core idea in theosophy is um, self-discovery. Um, learning to think, learning to observe, learning to um, uh, put together propositions of cause and effect, um, learning to uh, choose um, actions 
whether uh, speech or practice. So uh, each individual is a center, that's a theme that Mr. Judge brings out, is a center of thought and action. So each individual has to learn to become a philosopher, has to learn to become a scientist, has to learn to understand what it is to um, what what religion what a religion is and what a religious uh, principle is. So it um, it very much depends upon the uh, the creative efforts to understand and to um, then see in, in doing that um, in time. Then, then the, the, the synthesis can emerge. Now, it does seem to be the case um, that some people have a, just a strong bent for scientific method. Others are uh, very devoted, and perhaps through that devotion, uh, gain insights into very important truths. Um, others just seem to be, you know, quick with philosophical reasoning and logic and um, yeah, interpretation of um, principles and building principles philosophically. So we do have different inclinations, uh, but uh, they should not be seen as you know pathways that never diverge. We really have to become um, seekers of wisdom from all three types of activity. And that's um, much more nourishing um, because we're, we're all aware that um, if you're only devoted to scientific method, um, you know, you, you, there's something missing. Uh, you kind of cut yourself off from other dimensions of reality. If you're only devoted to um, some religious truths, um, you know, we tend to say, well, that person gets isolated from reality um, and cannot be as effective. So um, part of the, 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 uh, the construction of a synthesis is to be open and set aside time uh, over a lifetime, it can't be every day or something, uh, to be open. Um, we. We hear that some uh, great mind like um, Einstein was open to um, spiritual and mystical uh, intuition, although he's known for not just his scientific inquiry, but uh, his quite abstract philosophical um, ability expressed mathematically. So we do, um, we do have examples of people who are crossovers. Um, we hear about how the Dalai Lama um, has a great interest in science, although he's you know, very um, um, associated with um, meditation practices in the Buddhist tradition. Uh, he seems to be very open to science and has brought scientists over, uh, open. So that's, I think, one of the um, one of the accomplishments of the 20th century um, is that there, and we think that uh, Madame Blavatsky and the Theosophical Impulsion uh, help with that, is that um, there's more crossovers between these three disciplines. And so it might uh, lead to something of a muddled mess um, within one's consciousness. Uh, but at least that there's an effort to uh, sift and sort out uh, both ideas and practices and to gain a larger experience because we shouldn't forget that part of the purpose of theosophical study um, is to experience truth, whether it's the truth of brotherhood or the truth of the um, of spirituality, it's to experience, um, and then that becomes um, direct proof that it's worthy of, that any particular line of inquiry um, is worthy of the effort to understand. 
Um, well, our time is um, up for this evening. We thank you for your attention and your questions and invite you back um, next week when the topic is God and Satan.